Good morning, church. It's great to see you this morning. Let's stand and praise our Lord today. With all your hearts. Praise Him, praise Him.
That song said my message, by the way. Amen. God bless you and welcome, church. I want to open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your sweet presence this morning. Thank you for all the saints that are here today, God, to worship you, to call on your name. Lord, as we look at your scriptures, open our hearts to your truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Take your Bibles and open with me, church, to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 13 and go through to verse 25. That's 1 Peter chapter 2. It's funny that Tammy sang that beautiful song so powerfully. And the first word in our scriptures this morning in verse 13 is submit. (laughs) Isn't God funny that way? Amen. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Won't you just highlight this in your mind, in your heart, in the Bible, the reason behind it. For the Lord's sake. Not for your sake. Not for their sake. Not for others' sake. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme. By the way, that was the emperor of Rome at the time. Or unto governors, little nobilities, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. First, I want you to see that there is a exhortation given by the apostle Peter that we follow the laws of the land giving respect to the authorities the government authorities that are over us now I want you to understand this is the same Peter that stood before the high priest And the Sanhedrin council, which was the absolute both social, political law and both religious law in his society. And they told him, 
with threats and beatings and warn him strictly, do not proclaim and preach salvation in the name of Jesus anymore. And he told them without hesitation, whether is right. Should I obey men or should I obey God? So you need to understand the Apostle Peter is not telling us to obey government absolutely. He's saying you follow government when it's peaceable and good and right and your responsibility as a Christian to do what is well. But he understands. You have an obligation more to God than the government. And there are times when you may be called to choose God. You might find yourself in a conundrum, a dilemma. The government says one thing and God says another. Who do I follow? Don't let it be any dilemma in your heart and mind already purpose. You follow God because He's your reason for following government in the first place. <laughs> Amen. So with that said, this is a powerful exhortation to the Christians. Be subject to the law. Don't be lawbreakers. Be good citizens. Respect the governing authorities for God and His sake. We'll get into that a little deeper. But first I want you to dive into the real meat in this passage here. Get us started off right. If we look at verse 14, it talks about governors and government and the king and the powers. And he says they got this job to do. One, to punish evildoers. Two, to praise those who are doing well. I want you to... Think of one word that really fits here and describes this and I think is the whole thrust of this passage from here to the end of the chapter even though the word is not actually used but it is described and talked about and it's something we need to recognize because it's a really popular word today and that is the word justice. <laughs> you see... Justice is when good is rewarded and evil is punished. If you want a definition of justice, there it is. What's good is rewarded and what's evil is punished and that is justice. But my friends, I want you to understand, Peter is saying that government has a real responsibility for justice. It's one of the basis for their existence. <clears throat> now, let's get back into that doing good. Not forgetting the whole idea of justice. We'll come right back to it. In verse 16, I'm sorry, verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, whenever I'm reading the Bible and I see that phrase, the will of God, man, I zero in. How many of you want to know the will of God for your life? You know what I find out? Very difficult, to be honest with you. <clears throat> Oftentimes I really want the will of God and to know the will of God when it is vague in my life. But when God makes His will very specific and very clear, even in print 
in the King James Bible, and it stands out in contrast to everything I hope for and want. Oh, I wish I didn't know the will of God at that moment. Just being honest. <laughs> but it says clearly, this is the will of God. Now, what's he about to put forward? Here in verse 15, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know, there is a whole world out there that despises God and His Christ. Just like Tammy said, that song, Christian, the name's hated these days. By the way, that was a derogatory name. They placed it on the church because they said, those are those Christians. It's interesting to me, we had that wonderful baptism last week. Praise God for it. What a blessing. And something I didn't preach, but I will another time, is that in being baptized, you are baptized literally into the name. The name of Jesus. The name of Christ. The name of God. That's why he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why in the book of Acts, he says, what must I do, brethren? After the gospel was preached, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. You see, there is that identifying with the name of the Savior and the Lord. And there's a world that's looking on in antagonism. There's a world that's looking on everybody that's a professing, born again, baptized, blood washed believer in Jesus Christ, and they're looking to bring accusation against God. Can I chase a rabbit for a minute? It does connect. You know, they just sent back this exploration information about a, a rover on Mars. Okay, now listen, I'm a science fiction nut, all right? Now that's the only thing I read as much as the Bible. <laughs> Not as much, but I did read a lot of science fiction in my time. And, you know, so I'm, I'm cool with that. I, I like space exploration. I'm into all that. And, you know, if they find out some stuff and learn some things, hey, that's great. But I want you to know their unapologetic expressed purpose for the rover mission to Mars. It is unequivocally for the purpose of proving that life existed on Mars. Now you're talking about millions of dollars spent just for the purpose to try to say that God does not exist and life is expanding all over the universe. Think about that. You think that the world isn't raging against our Christ? All their resources and powers are working to prove a false narrative that rejects and defies God because the only consistent narrative of origin and life is the biblical narrative. And they're doing everything they can to prove a narrative that writes out God. It's just interesting to know. And what does that have to do with us? Because God's will for your life and for my life is to live in such a way by the good that we do. Not by the resistance. Not by the animosity. Not by clever talk but by the good works in our life, silence the infidels. 
Wow. Think about that for a minute. You mean my actions have more power to silence God's enemies than all the sermons I could ever preach? <laughs> Think about that. One good deed done in the name of Jesus Christ inspired by the Holy Spirit at the right time and the right place has more power to turn someone to faith in Christ from their foolish rejection of God than all the sermons you could ever preach. Oh, don't get me wrong. The sermons need preaching. But the deeds, the good doing, the Bible calls it right here, well doing, it speaks very loud to those hearts that are in defiance of God. Is everybody still with me? You ain't lost on Mars, Rover? Okay. I didn't want to, I didn't want to get you out there in the solar system and leave you now. Let's, let's come on back to the Scriptures. <clears throat> now, if we pick back up in verse 6, we're going to look at 16, we're going to look at uh, what it looks like to be and do well. What is the well doing? What is the description that he gives? Because he gives us some examples. Verse 16. As free, but not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Here it comes. Four things he gives us. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. And that's not King Capital, King Jesus. It, that goes without saying. This is political leaders. He's talking about the Emperor of Rome at the time. <clears throat> I want you to look at these four a little bit more in depth. Honor all men. What does that mean? We owe everybody basic human respect. There's nothing I hate worse than to be disrespected. <laughs> Don't you? You hate it. You ever been at the, at the McDonald's or, or at fast food or drive-in or a convenience store or even Walmart and, and the, somebody just, you know, you just need a little assistance. You say, uh, can I get some help, ma'am? And, and they just act like they just disgusted that you exist and that you would even question or think that they should give you some help. And you're thinking, I thought you worked here. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Used to, you could ask somebody at Walmart where something was. It didn't matter if they worked there. Oh, yeah, you know, if you go down that aisle over there, it's, it's right up there on the shelf. <laughs> you ask an employee something now, and they're like, <laughs> what's he asking me that for? That ain't my department. Oh, I'm meddling. That's all right. But you know what I'm talking about. Respect. Let me tell you something. This is where so often I believe Christians go wrong. We think someone's deserving of respect and yet not another person. You see, basic human respect applies to everybody. That means every person you meet, whether they're strange, whether they're indifferent, whether they like you or whether they don't. Whether it's the bum on the street asking for money. Whether it's somebody in authority positions at work. Whether it's somebody you encounter in passing. Everybody is somebody and deserves basic human respect. <clears throat> I have to get Aretha Franklin in here to sing it. It's one of my favorite songs. Now. And she can sing too. <clears throat> I don't want to stay there too long. So the first one is basic respect. Honor all men. Then we see love the brotherhood. Man, when I see what takes place so often in Christendom, 
in church culture and denominations and even in our own beloved SBC, all the, the mudslinging, all the resentment, all, all the, that goes on, supposedly sometimes in the name of righteousness, it really upsets me. Because one thing about it, God has called believers to love other believers. There's a supernatural spirit within us that has a yearning love for others who possess the same spirit. It's like a magnetic attraction. You get two magnets, one over here, one over here, and it's like whoop, whoop, let them go. Shh. Two believers in a workplace ought to be the same way. You ought to be going about your day and all of a sudden, whoa, something about that guy over there is just, I'm drawn to him. Only to talk a little bit and discover they're a follower of Christ also. They possess that self-same spirit that's there. How much more when we come together in His presence, in His name, is that love to be there? Not only for our congregation, but for the brethren all over the world. Because the church, the church is worldwide. In fact, the Bible says, world without end. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, let's move on. So we see basic human respect. That's well doing when we show that to everyone. We see, we display our love for the brethren. That's particularly a good work because Jesus said they will know you are Christians by the love you have one for another. <clears throat> and then we also see the fear of God. Something that is so often lacking in Christianity today. A basic concept that God is the righteous judge and He's watching me and He's watching you. That's largely missing today. We conduct ourselves in the fear of God. There will definitely be well-doing. And then finally, honor the King. What does that mean? Well, it means recognize the governmental authorities. So long as they don't intrude on God's authority, do what they say. They say go 55, you go 55. Ish. <laughs> you're going to go 55, you're going to go what Byron police say because you're going to get a ticket if you don't. I know. I know. So, <clears throat> What does it mean? It means give them that respect of obeying the laws and the ordinances that their authority, authority, governmental authority, demands. Don't be a lawbreaker. Let's move on. We talked about justice. Justice being the reward of what is good and the punishment of what is evil. But if you look at verse 18, it starts out with a people that largely in their society and in society all throughout history can get no justice. Look at that word in verse 18. In the King James, servants. In many modern translations, slaves. These are people that even the basic laws aren't protecting these are people that fall under that basic power of government authority to provide justice they fall within the cracks servants but look what the command is to them be subject to your masters 
with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. Some translations, the harsh. For this is thankworthy. If you could just circle that, mark that in your Bible. Thankworthy. Another way of saying that is commendable. Applaudable. For this is thankworthy. This is commendable. If a man for conscience sake toward God. Remember it started out. Obey the authorities for the Lord's sake. It says here. If a man for conscience sake. Toward God. Endure grief. Suffering wrongly. Now I just want to point out suffering wrongly. Isn't that. A description of injustice. Suffering wrongly is a description of injustice. If justice is the reward of what is good and the punishment of what is evil, then injustice is the reversal of that. It is the punishment of what is good and the reward of what is evil. So if you're suffering, and you're suffering wrongly under injustice, this is who it's talking to. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted, most translations beaten, for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. I often pray this prayer because Lord knows I'm a fool. Lord, don't let me suffer for my own stupidity. It's a good prayer, by the way. He's kept me pretty good in this. I'm telling you, you ought to pray it sometime. Lord, don't let me suffer as a fool or an evildoer. That's my prayer. But here it is. But if when you do well and you suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable or applaudable with God. Now you need to think about that for a minute. Injustice. The reward for evil and punishment for good. And the Bible tells us very clearly. When you're suffering for what is good. You're doing good and others are doing evil to you because of it. When with faith you suffer it with patience, God stands up and says, That is my servant. <laughs> God applauds your exercise of faith in the midst of suffering and justice. When you suffer with patience and faith, God Himself commends you. Y'all should have said amen right there. <laughs> Want to know what God celebrates? What is commendable? By God, what does he stand up and applaud and tell the angels of heaven? Look on that. It's the person enduring injustice with patient, long suffering faith. Wow. It gets even better, church. It gets even better. If we pick up in verse 21. And I want y'all to read with me so y'all don't think I'm making this up. For even here unto were ye called. Wait a minute now. What does that say? What does that apply to? 
He's applying it to those who are enslaved, who are suffering cruelty, who are suffering injustice, and yet they're enduring it with a patient faith. And the Bible says, even to this, you are called. Friends, I want you to know, we've been told that we are called to health and wealth and prosperity in our society and in the false Christianity today. But the Bible says that you are called to suffer persecution and injustice for the name of Christ. Whew. Think about that for a minute. Herein are ye called. Maybe many of you are thinking right now, that ain't what I signed up for. Better read your Bibles. When you make a contract with God, it ain't easily broken. And this is what you signed up for when you said, I want to take on me the name of Christ. He says, you are called to suffer injustice. If you don't believe me, look at the next part of this verse. In verse 21, because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us and what? Ouch. That we should follow His steps. We're about to read three steps in Christ's example. They all start with the pronoun, the personal pronoun, <laughs> Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Mark down step one, holiness. Holiness. Who, still talking about Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Mark down step number two. Submission to God's justice. <laughs> Submission to God's justice. Oh, we need to stay here for just a minute. You see, when he was hated, instead of hating back, when he was attacked and afflicted, instead of retaliating, instead of defending himself, what is even his mouth, the Bible says, he was like a lamb silent before the slaughter. Instead of returning hate and resentment and animosity to those who directed it towards him, he submitted himself to God, the God of justice. <laughs> The one that judges righteously. I want to put out there for you that this was a faith submitting. This was done in faith, believing in the character, in the person of God, believing in the nature of God's justice as being absolute and perfect. And so he did so. And he gave us that example. But I want you to move on to the next step. Step number three. That is the atonement. Remember these steps, by the way. The first one. Holiness. 
The second one, submission to God's justice. And the third one, atonement. Back to that personal pronoun referencing Christ in verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again when he suffered. He threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. When Jesus submitted himself to God's justice, the result was the substitutionary atonement that provides justification, and healing of the human soul. You see, the power of the cross, the power of the cross is a soul healing. We'll see that in the next verse, by the way. When it says, by his wounds, we are healed, it isn't just a healing for physical afflictions. It is a healing supernaturally of the human soul. When Jesus submitted himself to God's justice, the result was that he provided in his subjection to God the means for salvation for you and I who are all wayward souls. <clears throat> I can see that sinking in. We're going to let it sink in for a minute. We're going to move on. But keep it in mind. Keep it in mind. <clears throat> the final step was atonement. These are three steps that the Apostle Peter says the believers are to follow Christ's example. I want you to really begin to zero in on the idea of Christ's of Christ's subjecting himself or submitting himself to God and to God's justice being the implication bringing about atonement. If you'll turn with me to one passage of Scripture, just one verse, just read it with me. It's a very important truth we need to understand about God concerning the atonement and concerning the gospel and the work of Christ. It's in Romans chapter 3. Probably you're familiar with Romans 3 or at least with some verses in it. We all probably know verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Wonderful verse. It's in the Romans road. I use it all the time. But verse 26 is, is just as important. And it teaches something very important about God. To declare, that is the gospel and the way God brought it about, his purpose to declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness. That's God's righteousness. That He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. You need to understand that God is a God of perfect justice. He is a God of perfect justice and the cross declares it to the world. And giving His Son for your sins and my sins and providing a means for wayward souls 
to be reconciled to His holiness, God has provided the declaration of His own justice and perfection. He is just and justifier of those that believe in Jesus. You see, the faith in Christ becomes the determining factor of a person's eternal outcome. Justification comes through our belief in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And condemnation comes on the rest of the world for unbelief. And in this means of determining eternal judgment for mortal souls, God has made Himself perfect in His justice. Because He's given everybody a chance. Now, let's go back. We see God, is, His justice is perfect. I want you to consider before we wrap this up, I want you to take a moment and consider maybe what this would have meant to the original recipients, those that were reading this letter, scattered all over the known world, and, and maybe their little church got it, and or a copy of it, probably more than likely a copy of it, and, and the pastor's reading it to the congregation, the congregation is hearing this, and, and they're scratching their heads, and, and what would they begin to get out of this? I think they would see that by their faith submitting to God's justice, they were following Christ, and evoking the power of His cross. Hear that out. These saints that were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. Some of them free people. Some of them were actually slaves. And when they hear this. They would know by submitting to God's justice. They were not only following Christ. In his example, but they were evoking the power of the cross. The cross is God's ultimate act of justice, it is there. That you and I find vindication in the atonement of Jesus Christ. Have you ever wanted to be vindicated? Have you ever been put down, lied about, thought ugly things about, people suspicious about you, and all along you pray and you say, God, I don't feel like I deserve this. It isn't right. It's not just. And I'm being accused and persecuted and looked down on unjustly. God help me. Have you ever been there? Most people have. Do you know what the Bible
testimony. The testimony is this. They believed the gospel. Friends, vindication happened at Calvary. And when you believed, you were sealed. You are vindicated. <laughs> it's a done deal. <laughs> you may be suffering some troubles now. You may have some gainsayers. You may have some opposition. You may face some evil powers over your head in the government places. But I tell you, friend, you can endure it because you know God's justice is perfect and you are sealed to the day of redemption. Wow. Now, What we need, friend. What we need as believers in this hour when the heat is turning up all over the world against Christians. When you hear about a church in Africa where over 100 people were slaughtered and we're just finding out about it months later Think that's a coincidence? News didn't want it to get out. When you hear about persecution in China and these communist countries where the saints and the churches are being torn down and where they did have some protection, it is decreasingly being deprived and taken from them. When we hear about in countries where other religions are dominant and the laws of the land place the Christians at the mercy of those who hate them. This is flowing in from all over the world. And then when we look at our own nation and land and we see the increasing antagonists in the people that are in our government, that are in our media, that are in our entertainment, that are in our education, that are even in our churches the increasing antagonist towards the God of this Bible and His sacred Christ and you as His followers. Oh, friends, what we need now more than anything is we need to follow Christ in a submission to God's justice. <laughs> friends, When we're able to do that and place ourselves even in the face of injustice completely into the hands of our just God, then it becomes evident that a healing, a divine healing has taken place in our souls. I'm going to read that final verse in chapter 2. 1 Peter. We're looking at verse 25. The atonement gave us justification, gave us new life in Christ. And look what it did. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Friends, I want you to know, and it's important in this hour, that submitting to God's justice is indicative of that transformation that Christ has effected with His atonement within our very souls. And I pray we don't see the hour, but I believe it's coming fast when that will be our very fate. Because in Revelation, they all came to faith by martyrdom. Not there yet. But we know from the Word of God, it is coming. We see the signs of the times. 
We see the increased persecution, not just uh, on a local scale, but I'm talking about world round. And we know that the power of Antichrist is increasing. And I say this, church, submit to the just one. Let Christ work His atoning power in your soul and through your faith in life as you walk hand in hand with God Almighty in this corrupt world. I'm going to ask you to stand. Nobody wants to be treated unjustly. Can't stand it. You and I can't stand it. There's something in our souls that can't stand it. But Jesus gave His back to the whip. He gave His hands to the nails. He gave His brow to the thorns. And He gave His soul to the cross. And he's calling you and I to take up our crosses and to follow him in faith, knowing that God's justice is not only perfect, but it's eternal. And the injustice we face today, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, it can't even begin compare with the riches in glory. Maybe God's speaking to your heart. Maybe the circumstances of our nation. Maybe the intensity of resentments all over and different ideas colliding and clashing. Values going awry. Maybe it's got you shaking. Maybe you're seeing Christians that are falling away all over. Some by compromising. Some by dropping out. Some by hiding in their homes. And you're wondering, what's my lot? What's my calling? What's God wanting of me in this time? And I tell you, friend, the Word of God is explicitly clear. Keep serving the Lord. Keep doing good even to those that hate you. Keep proclaiming the name of Jesus and the gospel of God's righteousness. Keep living before a lost world, showing them an example of divine life existing within your soul. And keep believing even when you are suffering injustice. Keep believing in the God of perfect justice. The justice He's already accomplished for you. God speaking to your heart. You need to assure it. You need to affirm it. You need to rededicate. You come. If you're here today and you've never, you've never received the transforming power of the atonement of Jesus Christ, this is your hour. This is your morning. God is calling you. Allow His blood to wash away your sin and to make you a child of the living God. As we sing, you come.
Every heart right, church? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You that our vindication has already been accomplished. Our salvation has already been provided. Our destiny has already been set by Your grace and the work at Calvary. And Lord, I pray evermore in the days to come that You help us to look at that perfection and find strength to follow in Your footsteps and to live in Your holiness and to submit to Your perfect justice. And Lord, through us, work and evoke the power of Your holy cross towards this world around us. I remember the words of the apostles said, I am crucified to the world. In another place he said, the world is crucified to me. Let that be our verse in these hours. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.